Okay, everybody, thank you for joining the, the AF Rope seminar series again. Uh, we're very excited to be back. I think last year we started the seminar series and already it was a big success. I've even found you some statistics. We so far had 21 regular seminars last year. We already did three week-long tutorials. And as you know, of course, we have people here in the room. We have people watching live from all over the world. Um, and also people watching the recordings, which in total have been watched over 4,000 times at this point. Um, so excited to be back. I do want to mention, of course, this wouldn't be possible, first of all, without Siva Teja Magaluri, who's organizing all of this, and Kami, who's making sure that this actually happens in practice and gets you lunch for these events. Um, so then it's up to me to introduce the first speaker. Uh, so today we have Mohit uh, Prabhushankar, um, who is from uh, Electrical and, and uh, Computers. I always mess it up. Electrical Computing Engineering. Um, he did his PhD here at Georgia Tech and is now a postdoc in the Omni Lab for Intelligent Visual Engineering and Science. So he has worked on everything ML and ML related, including image processing, active learning, healthcare, robust and explainable AI. And robust AI is, is exactly what's going to be the topic of today. So we're going to learn, if I understood correctly, how to make neural networks more robust, which is obviously a very relevant and important topic to many of us here today. Uh, Mohit has won a number of awards, including Best Paper at ICIP, uh, Outstanding Teaching Awards, Excellence in Research Awards from ECE. Um, so I'm very excited about this. So without further ado, um, Mohit, please go ahead. Thank you, Kevin. That was a, that was a great introduction. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, the goal of this talk is basically to introduce you towards robust neural networks and go through three things, explainability, uncertainty, and intervenability. Now, in its own right, each of these topics is probably a talk in itself. So there's going to be some places where it feels like I'm just going to be you know, racing through the slides. But if anybody has any questions, please you know, feel free to stop me. And we can go slower in certain places. Uh, and afterwards as well, I'll be available. Uh, we can uh, talk afterwards after the seminar is over, or you can contact me via email, or anything is uh, perfectly fine. So. This is the uh, title slide, Towards Robust Neural Networks. So the goal of the entire talk will be towards talking about what exactly is robustness and how do we achieve that robustness, specifically from a human-centric perspective. The reason I say that is the idea of robustness is something that has existed for a while. Like we knew from a long time back that neural networks have certain flaws within them, uh, whether they are like engineered adversarial kind of a noise, whether they are these kind of perturbations, uh, simple rotations, in fact, can cause these issues. And neural networks, which are extremely important in an AI setting and which have actually uh, brought us towards a lot of technical advances, have these uh, robustness issues. Now, these seem kind of um, um, like I'm showing you these uh, results. I'm showing you stuff that only does not work. But there are many instances in real life where robustness can be an issue. Like this particular slide, I usually bring it up all the time uh, because there are these images of these cute dogs and then muffins. And it requires a little bit of time for us to go through them and see which is a muffin and which is a dog, uh, which kind of is unintuitive. But it is, in reality, it is true. Even for us as humans, sometimes it may not be easy for us to uh, uh, do. Now, how do we train neural networks? or How do we have neural networks overcome these deficiencies? Well, the simple solution, or maybe uh, the answer, should, the, it's, I should not say a simple solution, but basically the solution is that we have to include these kind of novel scenarios during uh, uh, training. That has been the holy grail of uh, most research in terms of how we try to overcome uh, robustness. But recently there have been quite a few cases that are made against this kind of a uh, setting. Uh, so for instance, Let's say, what phase of a neural network training do we add this kind of novel scenarios and this novel data? Uh, let's say in an active learning setting, we ha and, and by active learning, I mean that in initially we have a small amount of data, then we keep on increasing this amount of data. Let's say we start off with a high amount of information, which is basically the novel scenarios. Our neural network does not train well in, these, in this uh, setting. It's because our model is not capable of understanding these uh, out of distribution or novel scenarios, and then come up with a very good representation space that can incorporate all these changes. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, lower the amount of information that the data is providing the network, better it is going to be, which kind of is unintuitive. Um, 
until you actually see the uh, images uh, at this particular point here, where if we choose these kind of data points that are specifically somewhere in the middle of distribution, you'll have a good enough model representation. But then if you have these out of distribution data point, just these data points that the network is training on, then you'll have a decision boundary that is not what it should be based on the amount of data available. So you should not start off a neural network training with these kind of high information scenarios. Then let's take the other case. So what if we start training everything with low information and then start introducing these novel scenarios at the end? Well, this also is kind of bad because there is this whole concept of something called catastrophic forgetting, where as soon as we start showing a network these novel scenarios, it kind of forgets everything that it has been trained on before. So there's no good practical solution in many cases where uh, we can definitively say that to get a robust neural network that can incorporate all novel scenarios, the, you know, the dog and muffin image that we saw earlier, this is the place where a network has to be trained. So uh, it's, it's very hard to come up with a single solution or a single statement that I can make where neural networks are going to be good in terms of uh, training for novel scenarios. So what would we do? What would humans do in this scenario? Well, the answer is that we introspect at inference. What does that mean? Uh, you know, first off, you can ask yourself, why am I being shown this slide? Well, I have an agenda here to go through what I have done. And basically that agenda uh, involves this introspection. That's why I'm showing you the slide on the right, basically, because this kind of muffins and uh, dogs are kind of similar. So why am I showing muffins rather than pastries? Well, it would have been very easy for us to actually see the difference, and it would not have proved the point that I'm trying to make. What if the dog was a bull mastiff instead of this? Again, the same reason. You know, I, I do have an agenda, and I am going to talk about how these kind of similar scenarios uh, uh, need to be kind of uh, uh, differentiated or contrasted with ones. And the answer about the introspection is I'm trying to now take what I said in words of introspection and trying to put it in this kind of a block diagram. If I want to have an introspection, then there needs to be two stages. One is a sensing stage, and the next one is a reflection stage, where the sensing is we make some kind of a snap decision, uh, which is you can think of it as a uh, stage one uh, uh, decision. But then after that, you would have to reflect on your choices. You would have to reflect on the prediction that you made by asking yourself, okay, why, if I were given the spoon bill image, for instance, and it has highlighted this portion of uh, the body. Uh, now I ask myself, okay, why is this a spoon bill rather than flaming? Can I come up with a good enough solution or answer to this question? Well, the answer is that the uh, these parts of this, the neck of the uh, spoonbill is basically different than a flamingo. So if I'm able to say uh, that uh, the, the, the image does not have the S-shaped uh, neck, then, okay, it cannot be a flamingo. It has to be a spoonbill and so on. You can do this for multiple other uh, uh, classes, let's say a crane, a pig, and whatsoever, and you'll get these kind of results. So essentially, we are reflecting on our answers. And Similarly, you can do for the previous slide as well, where you can actually look at the image of the dog again. You can look at the muffin again and ask yourself, okay, is this really a muffin? Can I see some fur? Can I see some other characteristics of a dog? And that's how we come to a solution. It's not like we have trained beforehand with lots of images in order to come to this conclusion. Rather, during inference itself, we are making a judgment and we are questioning that judgment. We are reflecting on that judgment and saying that, okay, this is a good enough scenario uh, for it to be a muffin or a dog and and so on. So this idea of introspection is basically uh, uh, going to lead towards this, uh, this, this idea of uh, robustness, at least currently from a very um, high level perspective without going into any theory, without going even into neural networks. Uh, but the, the results actually are from neural networks. The answers are all actually from uh, neural networks. I'll come to that in a little bit. Um, and this is why we want to have these kind of neural network uh, uh, introspection at inference, because there is always going to be deficiencies in neural networks. We cannot just say that we want to make the best training and get the solution. Uh, the best laid plans of sensors and networks, they definitely go every, by the way. So, you know, all engineers, we all know this. And we want to make sure that this is not the case during uh, inference. With that, I want to come to the three major measures that I will talk about that will lead to either introspection or robustness, which is uncertainty, explainability, and intervenability. Now, all three measures, all three topics, as I said, are talks among themselves. So I'll be very brief in all of them. 
the one major takeaway that I want um, that I want to talk about is that all three concepts are interconnected. We cannot talk about one of these concepts without talking about the other. Now, un, uh, explainability, I think uh, everyone should be familiar with. Anybody who has worked with uh, neural networks, it's basically the field where we want to uh, discuss why a network made a certain prediction. Uncertainty is basically the idea of not knowing what the network does not know. Uh, it needs to know what it does not know, which kind of, if you parse through that, makes a little bit more sense. And I have a few slides later on. Intervenability is an idea where we as human beings can actually go through and ask questions to the network. We can go through and prompt it in a way and ask the, the questions that I mentioned before, asking why Spoonbill rather than Flamingo. So uh, it's not a complete end-to-end uh, -end decision, but rather human beings can uh, interrupt a network's decision process and make it come to a decision that you would like it to come to uh, based on some measures, which in this case are going to be answered and uh, explainability. And robustness basically requires all three of these concepts, not just a single one, because all three of them are interconnected. If we make one of them very good, if we make a very good explainable neural network, then in a way, we have not accounted for the uncertainty. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Let's talk about the first one, which is... Um, I'm sorry, just give me a second. Share your screen. Oh. In, uh, in Teams. Yes. All right. So, Zoom. Yes. I'm doing that. Um, this should yeah, work. Should be working, right? That should be. Thank you. Uh, sorry for that. So let me just continue where I was talking before. So to start, I started talking about visual explanations. And by the way, everything that I'm going to talk about today is basically on visual data, uh, on, on like simple natural images. But in the lab, we work on more uh, seismic images. We work on other uh, biomedical images, OCT images specifically, X-ray images and stuff like that. But um, today, everything I'm going to discuss is on these kind of simple natural images that you're going to see on uh, ImageNet data set, if you're familiar. It's one of the most common data sets in visual uh, learning. It has about 1,000 different classes. And this image is one of the more famous images that uh, is taken from that uh, 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 data set where uh, most of the explainability techniques use this image as one of the, um, uh, to showcase their results essentially. So what is a visual explanations? So explanations, you can define them as a set of rationale uh, used to understand the reasons behind a particular decision. If I give this image to a network, it basically says, okay, you are my, uh, the image is that of a bull mastiff. And if you ask why, it needs to highlight regions within that image. In this case, if I ask the question of why bull mastiff, a network has to highlight the uh, the regions in the face of the dog. It makes sense to us because that is why we would say that this is a bull mastiff. And then we can ask the question, what if the bull mastiff was not in the image? Then it needs to say that, okay, I would have made a decision based on the cat, the tiger cat, which is at the bottom. So it needs to highlight that portion. Again, completely human interpretable. This is essentially what uh, uh, the network is showing us. The contrastive basically is why bull mastiff rather than a boxer. So if I ask this kind of a question, it needs to show that the jowls of the bull mastiff is a little bit more prominent than that of a boxer. And that is why the network has not made that particular decision. Again, these are all uh, questions that I can ask a neural network from an explainability perspective. And you can classify them into these kind of three big paradigms. Uh, you can think of them as observed correlations, which is the first one, the question there being why bull mastiff. The second one could be some kind of an counterfactual. Uh, basically, any question that starts off with what if can be considered a counterfactual and contrastive explanation, which is the one on the right, where why bull mastiff rather than a boxer. So from a philosophical perspective, it's why P rather than Q, uh, where if you can answer such a question, you have answered a contrastive question. 
uh, question. Now, a neural network essentially needs to be able to answer all these three questions in order to satisfy uh, all the different stakeholders, because there are going to be different stakeholders in terms of interpretability, uh, explainability. Uh, the simple question of why Spoonbill, uh, in this particular case, a network needs to highlight all the different parts uh, of the body of the Spoonbill, you know, the pink and round body, straight beak. So in this case, uh, let's say a child is asking such a question and the network needs, uh, and, and if the child needs to learn about Spoonbills, this is a perfect solution. It's telling everything that a child needs to know about what a Spoonbill bird is. But let's say the, the stakeholder in this case is not a not someone who is uh, who doesn't know anything about a Spoonbill, but rather it is someone like an ornithologist who has access to understanding what the difference between a Spoonbill and Flamingo is. So when such a person asks the question, why Spoonbill rather than Flamingo, the network has to uh, highlight the, uh, the uh, lack of S-shaped neck in the image. So in that case, the ornithologist will start trusting the uh, network, not just trusting, but basically the ornithologist will assess the network and say that, okay, this network knows what it's talking about. Not only does it know that the image is that of a spoonbill, but it can answer these kind of very fine-grained questions, uh, these contrastive questions where it can answer the why uh, P rather than Q kind of uh, questions. So there are multiple stakeholders in terms of interpretability, and we have to be careful that we are uh, satisfying all of them. So it needs to explain a decision, it needs uh, to be able to help in assessing the network, and it needs to be able to garner some kind of trust in itself. So these are all the different things that explainability needs to achieve. Uh, and 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 it's required that a network does this. Now, let me very quickly talk about how I got those three um, uh, uh, images that you saw uh, before, the, the correlations, the contrastives, and the counterfactuals. It's actually a combination of gradients and activation features. Now, um, we use both gradients and activations in this particular case. Again, all of this is done in a post hoc setting. Uh, it's not during any training. A network has been completely trained. It's very well trained. You have a good prediction that is coming out of it. Now, the goal is just to see why this prediction was made. So this is basically what we call post hoc, where we know what the solution is, we have access to the label, a train network, and we are getting some kind of a measure out of it, which in this case is uh, explainability. We use these kind of gradients and activations to do this. Um, we want activations because they're class discriminative and they provide some uh, spatial information. And I'll talk about why gradients in a little bit. The most common and one of the best uh, uh, algorithms or one of the easiest algorithms for us to use in explainability is GradCam, uh, gradient class activation maps. It's very simple. Uh, uh, essentially, you take an image, you pass it through the CNN, you get a final output. You take the logit from the last layer and back propagate it, uh, let's say, to the last final fully connects, uh, the last uh, convolution layer. And there's a little bit of math involved in order to get uh, the, uh, uh, the grad cam, which is being shown here. You take all the gradients, you collapse it into a single number, which is a weighing function, alpha. And this weighing function basically multiplies the activations. And once you do that, you get your grad cam result and you kind of blow it up back to the image size that was there. So this is a very simple description of what grad cam is uh, doing, and you get access to this kind of an explanation uh, uh, map out of it. Gradients are giving you some kind of a weight that then you're putting on top of your activations, which is giving you local information as to why the network has made this kind of a um, uh, decision. Now, this gives you this idea of why P explanation. If I were asking where P is basically the prediction or the logic, uh, I can get this kind of observed cor correlation based on GradCam. Now, there's very simple things that we can do on top of GradCam in order to get the other two. For instance, in the same paper uh, the, where GradCam was uh, um uh, published, they also had this idea of a counterfactual kind of an image. Uh, it's only a single counterfactual, but essentially we can negate the uh, gradients instead of back propagating uh, the logit itself. We brought back propagate a negation of the logit, and essentially what it's doing is it's deleting all the features that led to a prediction p, and looking at all the other features that would be required in this particular case. So you can think of that as a counterfactual modality where what if these features were not in an uh, in the image? Then we are left with the other parts of the image, which is the tiger cat in this particular instance. Um, Another simple thing that can be done on top of it is this idea of backpropagating. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering is the gradient updates where it's going into the problem, or uh, just you derive into the problem? Uh, I'm sorry, could you uh, repeat that? So is the gradient update, I'm sorry, is the gradient responding to the problem? Okay. Yes, exactly. So uh, I'm not sure if the online people can hear you, but essentially the question was, is the gradient uh, a function of the prompt? Correct? 
Yeah. It, it is definitely, yes, it is a function of the prompt. And in this case, the prompt is basically what we are giving it. So, you know, YP is if that is a prompt, it is going backwards and giving us that kind of a uh, result. Yeah, the problem is encoded by supporting values. In this case, it's in this case, I'm just doing uh, without words. It's all visual encoding. So in this case, I'm just looking at the uh, the the logic of this particular uh, layer. So instead of actually using prompt as a word-based mechanism, I'm directly looking at the network and the network logic and backpropagating that uh, uh, instance. Yeah. So uh, this was kind of actual, where I'm negating it, and the other one. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking a loss function between a prediction P and some contrast class uh, Q. So asking the question of why P rather than Q is basically a loss function that I can get between P and a Q, and I'm backpropagating the uh, loss function, this J P comma Q uh, within the GradCam framework. Again, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but even in the counterfactual thing, uh, everything, the only difference from GradCam, difference from GradCam is the negation of the class, is the negation of the logic. In this case, the only different difference from GradCam Cam, is that in, instead of backpropagating the logic, we are backpropagating a loss function on um, uh, top of it. And we get access to this contrast cam where you know the jowls of the dog are uh, shown basically to show the difference between either a boxer or a um, uh, uh, bull mastiff in this particular case. Uh, now, I do have a few examples of where it is helpful, but in the interest of time, I just go through uh, I'll probably go to the next stage, which is essentially what we can do with these contrastive explanations and how it relates to uncertainty and intervenability. Because again, the main point of the talk is to actually um, drive home the point that explainability, intervenability, and uh, uncertainty are all kind of uh, related to each other. So let's talk about this kind of variance of induced contrastive explanations for quantifying uncertainty. Now, uh, let me jump to this concept of something called predictive uncertainty. The idea of predictive uncertainty is that there's some kind of variance in uh, uh, prediction. Let's say I have a neural network. I started training it from a random set of weights, and I get a uh, fully trained network. I take the same network using the same uh, procedure for training, but start with a different set of random weights. Ideally, in optimization, we want to make sure that it comes to the same uh, uh, network parameters. But usually in neural networks with a very large training set, it does not go in that direction. Rather, we have this concept of epistemic uncertainty where you'll have different parameters that uh, uh, you'll get out of the network. And what it does is that even though your prediction may be the same, you know, yeah, network one trained with a certain initialization weights, you get the same prediction of a bull master. Network two trained with a different initialization weights, you get the same prediction of a bull master. But the actual parameters and more importantly, the output logits are going to be different. Uh, yes, if you take the max of these logits, you'll get the same answer, you'll get the same prediction. But if you take the logits themselves and take a variance across it, it is going to be different. And that is because of uh, uncertainty. Uh, and, and in literature, you have a large amount of um, uh, different uncertainties we are looking at. I think the two most common ones as being aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. Uh, in this presentation, I'm not going to talk about uh, separating the two, aleatoric and epistemic. Rather, I'm just going to consider the entire uncertainty as a single quantity, which is called predictive uncertainty, which is that uncertainty uh, is due to variance in this kind of prediction logits that exist. In that case, we can decompose this uh, predictive uncertainty into two parts. This is just variance decomposition, where it's expectation y given sx and variance of y given sx. So we have this two things where we can uh, uh, do a variance decomposition on my variance of prediction and get this kind of a, uh, output. Now, let's say what, what each of these terms in this scenario means. Now, y is, of course, my prediction. It's the logic out of my predictions. V of y is the variance. It is essentially the uncertainty. Sx is basically some subset of data that I'm using. So I'm showing two uh, Sx here, which is Sx1 and Sx2. These two subsets are highlighting different features within the network. Now, I'll talk about what they are, but essentially I'm just trying to um, uh, bring out the, uh, the, the, the definition in terms of explanations that I had uh, uh, before. So given a certain subset, uh, I can quantify the two different terms, which is the expectation y given sx and the variance of y given uh, uh, sx. Um, I'll talk about the left one a little bit, but the right one is essentially the act of choosing sx uh, creates a predictive uncertainty with respect to all other subsets. So by 
picking a few uh, features, uh, we are creating an uncertainty within the network that is not uh, explored at all. The reason being that, let's say this were an explanation. Let's say that SX1 and SX2 were uh, explanation. Like GradCam is, is giving me SX1. And there's another uh, methodology called GradCam++, which is, given me, uh, which is giving me SX2. Both of these uh, methods are explanation methods that are picking highlights or picking features within the uh, um, uh, image in order to show why the uh, the network predicted them as a certain uh, uh, class. So the way I can say that one explanation is better than the other is by uh, intervening on the image with these uh, explanations. So I'm just going to, instead of passing the whole image on the left, I'm just going to pass the intervened image or just the uh, SX1 essentially within the network. And I'm going to see what the output is going to be. Is it the same? Uh, let's say this is a spoonbill. Does SX1 tell me that it's a spoonbill? Then that means it's a good explanation, right? Because it's the, the explanation has picked up the right highlights. In the same way, SX2, if it has also given a good explanation or if it also gives me the same uh, prediction, it is also a good explanation. That is essentially what how these explanatory methods are uh, kind of evaluated. One is better than the other because it is picking the better subset of features from within the network. So in other words, yes. Think of them as a set of semantic features or semantic uh, pixels. So if I have a library of images and uh, you have these concept vectors basically where you have access to, okay, this is the neck, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, feathers, uh, the beak and all these things. Each of those features is part of SX. So SX is essentially a union of all possible features that exist throughout the uh, uh, image. It's in the pixel space, but it's not a subset of images within the entire library. Within each image, it, uh, there's some kind of uh, features that exist that has led the network to make uh, these kinds of decisions. And those data features are defined how? Sorry? How, how are those features defined? There are data sets where you already have access to these uh, features. Birds is one example of these uh, uh, data set. Yeah, but even without that, uh, even without having access to these features, we can just think of them as a set of pixels that are together. Like this data set does have uh, those features that you just mentioned, but in ImageNet, you don't have access to those fine grain features, but rather if you use explanations, they give you these features, they extract these features and from a pixel level, you have access to uh, SX1 and uh, uh, SX2. Different explanations give you a different uh, subset of images basically. And the way we are evaluating them is by passing these intervened images through the network and then seeing the uh, what the prediction, if the prediction changes. You don't want the prediction to change. If it does, then the features that you have extracted are not good, essentially. But what it is doing is that it's only highlighting the first uh, uh, term here, which is the expectation of Y given SX. But the next one, which is the variance of Y given SX, is usually not considered at all. So whenever we think of explanations, um, these, uh, yes. So you pick out the SX, you are, uh, what was that, the other pixels that, is that? Yes, I'm, I'm removing all the other pixels and I'm only taking, so if I were to go back to one of the explanation kind of things, so I'm just taking the highlights here. So this part will be taken, everything else that is in blue is going to be blacked out essentially. So I'm going to take that blacked out or actually grayed out is a correct terminology. So just, uh, you take the, the mean and variance of the network thing and you're just going to pass that through so that it's not going to affect your other uh, parts of your decision. So that is how we evaluate these kind of explanations. We take only these highlighted features, pass this image back with only the face and see if the network is still predicting a bull master. If it is, well done, your explanation. Otherwise, there's some problem with what your explanation is giving you. But, uh, but black also means something. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I mentioned uh, you generally, it is not black. It's just easier for me to show that it was all black. But you take the mean of the network. Like for ImageNet, I think the, uh, the first layer itself, you just do mean, uh, you just remove the mean, right? Uh, from every image, you take that mean and instead of black, it's going to be that value. I think it's 0 0.462, 0 0.5. I mean, we can just think of it as 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 as the RGB, which is uh, something similar to like a grayscale kind of a network so that you don't want to introduce
introduce this kind of an additional um, a problem within the evaluatory uh, approach. Um, so existing explanations only partially reduce this kind of predictive uncertainty. So the second term, which is a residual term between SX and SX cap is not reduced. What does this term mean actually? Um, the fact that I'm only choosing a part, a subset of the image and passing it back to the network is a problem uh, because it creates a different kind of a, a variance. So, you know, I have this kind of a, um, SX1 here. What if I'd added, added another pixel at this spot? I'm not, you know, it's not grayscale or it's not black. It's what the image had to be. What if I added another pixel over here or, or um, over there and so on, right? So these are not something that a, that the current evaluation setups are uh, looking at because this, and, and that is basically what the second term there in the variance recomposition is giving. So one way of thinking about what explanations are is that it has nothing to do with actual explanations. It has nothing to do with humans, and it has nothing to do with what a neural network is actually doing. Rather, all it is doing is reducing a, a, a partial uncertainty within the neural network. Um, and, and this is concerning because as explainability, like we want explanations to be human understandable. We want explanations to be interpretable to uh, different stakeholders. But if anything that neural network is doing is just reducing its uncertainty and giving us uh, just the first term in this kind of uh, epistemic uncertainty, that becomes an issue, right? So the second term itself has a uncertainty associated with it. So think about it like this. If I have an explanation that gives me a very large area here, that technically is going to be a very good explanation based on the evaluation because it is going to give me a good uh, result nonetheless out of it. So we want to make sure that these kind of explanations um, are not just reducing the uncertainty. And we need to look at the second term as well and try to understand what this uncertainty is uh, giving us. Now, the problem in doing something like that is that, as I said, I can take one pixel on top and say that, okay, this is giving me uh, a different setup. I can take one pixel on the right and say this is giving me a different setup. So there is an infinite combination of interventions that can happen within the network for me to actually find uncertainty. So any kind of Monte Carlo method that I put on top of this is always going to be problematic because I'm trying to find these counterfactuals. I'm trying to find these complements of sets uh, that exist, and it's very difficult, very hard for me to uh, get all of them. So instead, if I use a contrastive explanations before, and instead of taking SX2, SX3 before, you can just take an intersection between uh, different subsets, because that is essentially what a contrastive explanation was giving us. It was YP rather than Q. There is a certain feature that exists between both SX1 and SX2 that needs to be shown through the contrastive explanation, correct? So I'm using that as a proxy for all kinds of interventions that I can do. And I take basically, uh, these are all different contrastive explanations that I can get out of it. And if I take variance of all 999 contrastive explanations, I get some kind of an uncertainty uh, uh, on top of the explanation that I already had. I have a few better images that I can show later on. Uh, the most important thing that we can see here is that every network every data point and every prediction has an uncertainty associated with it. Now, um, usually we look at uncertainty as a conglomerate. We look at it as a certain uh, number that is that exists for the entire data set. But if you look at a fine grain level, then many things that affect this. Uh, that this includes the kind of uh, uh, network we're using. For instance, VGG16 versus the uh, Swin transformer. Now, if I just, uh, let's just concentrate on the first four images here. If I look at VGG16, this is the grad cam explanation of why this is a bull mastiff. But it's really not sure about the snout of the dog. If it is uncertain about something, it's because it is uh, about the snout of the dog. Look at Swin Transformer on the other hand. The snout of the dog is pretty prominent in the prediction. So it doesn't care about what, uh, so it is not uncertain about it at all. Rather, it's more uncertain about what is there in uh, the, the bottom over here. Um, and all of what I said was for correct prediction. Let's say initially it has made an incorrect prediction. What happens is that the initial grad cam itself is not good, but the uncertainty is more uh, uh, dispersed, essentially. You have a higher signal to noise ratio uh, in this kind of an uncertainty explanation than you had uh, before with a correct explanation. Um, 
Same thing with the spin transformer as well. And this actually has two uh, different insights over here, which is that if you have a wrong prediction, your uncertainty has increased quite a bit uh, in terms of uh, uh, where these things exist. And that seems like a, um, a straightforward insight, but when you start looking at different measures of how to quantify this uncertainty. And if you start intervening again within the data, it becomes a little bit more problematic. So for this case, in this case, let's say I have a spoon bill and now I start adding noise. I'm not sure if it's very much visible here, but I've added quite a bit of noise from A to B and then from B to C. Uh, your explanations change essentially, but your uncertainty is something like this. Your uncertainty, as long as the uh, explanation or, or the prediction is correct, actually becomes uh, better in the sense that it focuses on what it needs to focus a little bit more than before, because um, essentially you're trying to give a causal aspect to this uh, uh, entire thing, where as long as you add more uh, noise, as long as you make the network worst, you are making sure that it's looking at the right features in order to make the decision. It's not looking at some kind of contextual features. It's looking at more like causal features uh, in order to make your uh, decisions. And your uh, log likelihood, which is basically your uncertainty, there's a drastic drop. As soon as there is some kind of a, um, um, uh, uh, like incorrect prediction, there's a drastic drop in uh, uh, this kind of lo uh, log likelihood, which is uncertainty. And in, on the other hand, the signal to noise, noise ratio of your explainability, your uncertainty also increases quite a bit. This basically shows that as and when my prediction becomes incorrect, there is a lot more dispersion within my explainability and my uncertainty, and it is not is it's not, we shouldn't just rely on the first term of basically looking at, okay, which network is better in making the explanation in order to say that, okay, this uh, explanatory technique is better than the other. It requires us to look at a secondary information source, which in this case is going to be uncertainty as well. Again, everything I'm saying is uh, more from a, uh, is to make sure that there is a connection between, is to show that there is a connection between explainability, uncertainty, and intervenability. More interventions we have, more uncertainty we are going to have, and more uncertainty we have, the worst our explanation is going to be. So we cannot just say that uh, a network is more explainable in order to say, uh, um, and, and, and then not make any claim about uh, 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 uncertainty or explainability. And from an intervenability point of view, if I do a lot more prompting, at a certain point, my prompting is going to be worse. Um, right, like there is this architecture called segment anything model these days, which does a uh, any segmentation possible, and up to a certain point, if we let's say we do four uh, prompting on top of that, the results are going to be good. But if we start doing something like forty or fifty, and I'm, uh, these these numbers are not uh, actual numbers, I'm using them as an example, we get worse results. At least this is what we have uh, observed when we are doing this. The reason is we can understand it through uh, an analysis of uncertainty rather than just looking at the uh, uh, prompting scores. Uh, all three of these things are very much uh, interlinked. Now, I started with robustness, and I do want to bring uh, robustness back. How do we use all this uh, information in order to do this kind of introspection? Because if you want a robust neural network, then what I'm suggesting is that usually in literature, we usually think that the more explainable a neural network, the most robust it's going to be. But I'm trying to say it is not. Yes. More explainable, I assume you are want to find this. Yeah. Some. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in literature, the metric is this one. The variance of ex expectation given Y given uh, SX is the metric for uh, explainability. So we take, a, we take an image, we put a mask on top of it, we pass it through the network and we get an output. Now there is other kinds of explainable uh, measures as well. And this involves actual humans going through and looking at the image and saying, okay, this explanation is better than this explanation. I would rather take SX1 rather than SX2. But that is very difficult to do on large scale data sets on like when you have millions of images. So uh, an objective way of doing it is by something like this, where you mask an image, pass it through the network again and see if there is a variance in your outputs. Ideally, you don't want that variance in your outputs because you want to know that your network has picked the right uh, features out of it. And that would be an objective way of trying to find uh, this thing. And, and that terminology is uh, the, the, currently the way of doing explainability uh, measures. Yeah. Uh, so going back to uh, how we can create robustness out of this, 
we want to simulate introspection in neural networks right now, but um, the definition is not very clear. How do we get this introspection? So let's start by defining introspection as answers to some logical and targeted questions. And the question then is, okay, what are these possible targeted questions? We already have access to this. We already talked about three of these kinds of paradigms where it can be some kind of correlations or it can be some kind of counterfactual questions or it can be some kind of uh, contrastive questions. All of them are pretty targeted. They're targeted at the prediction that was uh, made. So we can take all these things in order to uh, show that introspection is possible based on these kind of targeted uh, answers. Now, we also uh, can give a, like a technical definition of what these features are. It's basically the gradients. Gradients are the ones that when we backpropagate uh, the logit, uh, we get uh, you know, the, the, the uh, correlation kind of answers. When we backpropagate the negative of the logit, we get uh, counterfactual answers. When we backpropagate this loss function, we get this kind of uh, 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 contrastive uh, features. So having access to the gradients themselves are essentially our features for anything that we can do on top of it, in this case, uh, introspection. Um, now I'm directly showing you the features themselves. From an MNIST data set, if I backpropagate, uh, let's say uh, this not very clearly is a five, but if I backpropagate that, you, you know, if I backpropagate a loss between zero and five, I'm forcing the network and saying, hey, you're not a five, you're a zero. What needs to change is basically the parameters of the last layer here. It's saying that all my zeroth features have to move in a certain way, while all the five features has to move away from what the actual decision is going to be. My backpropagate one, it's basically this is moving here and so on, right? So there is these kind of gradient features, uh, which are very spatially localized, and they're also pretty uh, sparse. They only exist at the points that we wanted to exist, which in this case, I've given a, a wrong answer to the network. I've given a wrong prompt to the network, and it's giving me uh, uh, what needs to change within the network to say uh, to show uh, uh, it has changed essentially. I can use all these features and train a very simple MLP on top of it. I can take these features, I can backpropagate zero, I can backpropagate one or any other feature that I want and concatenate it into a feature and essentially uh, just convert it into this Rx1 where if I have like 10,000 images, I can just train based on the same training data. I can train a very simple MLP. In this case, I think we train just a three net three layer MLP network on top of it and get a uh, output. What we noticed was that the results were uh, both generalizable and calibrated. Generalizable in the sense that um, even with some kind of out of distribution data, very noisy data, network was able to get much higher uh, results. Calibrated in the sense that the difference between prediction accuracy and prediction confidence uh, was uh, pretty much uh, uh, improved. Uh, I do have some results on Cypher 10C, Cypher 10 Cure, where uh, the same networks, which are were in the bottom right corner here, increase and move to the top left corner, um, basically uh, when you have this kind of a, a MLP on top of the network. This MLP with the features where we backpropagate the wrong prompts and get the features are essentially what is making the network more robust. In the sense that if I go back, this first part here is more of a sensing thing where it makes a snap judgment. It says that this image is that of a five, let's say. But then it's we ask it to then reflect and say, okay, could it be a zero? Could it be a one? And if not, why? We are taking these features and training an MLP, and that is essentially giving us a more robust uh, result. And the way we quantify robustness in this case is generalizable and more uh, calibrated. And we did it across different um, uh, applications. This was for recognition, um, and we did it for a couple of other uh, applications as well. There's active learning, there's out of distribution detection, uh, there's image quality assessment. In all these cases where there is some kind of an out of distribution element to it, uh, an MLP is more robust than a network that was there because we have access to these gradient information coming from different, um, the wrong prompts in this particular uh, uh, case. Now, we do have uh, one more where this is directly uncertainty, where instead of taking all these features and you know concatenating them and training a network, we just take an L2 norm across them. We just literally, all features, we collapse it into a single number, taking L2 norm. And surprisingly, it did very well in uh, in a number of applications, including out of distribution detection, where essentially uh, given Cypher 10 as in distribution and out of distribution is SVHN, Tiny ImageNet, and LSUN networks, uh, LSUN datasets, uh, our method was uh, comfortably better than a lot of other uh, existing algorithms. Again, it's very simple, straightforward. We don't need access to any new training data. 
uh, all we are doing is just giving the wrong prompt and seeing what the outputs are. And these wrong prompts, of course, are generated based on the fact that we know that what the prediction is and we are sending an incorrect uh, uh, prediction ourselves. Um, uh, we we do have uh, the same thing work with adversarial images as well. Adversarial images are these uh, uh, these class of images where we add this kind of very small engineered noise to our original image that changes the network's prediction. So if this is panda with fifty seven percent confidence. This kind of noise. Uh, 0.07 multiplied by this noise, which is very small. It's imperceptible. You can see this here. The noise is imperceptible, and uh, it's still a panda. Of course, we can easily make it out. But a network thinks that it's a given with a 99.3% confidence. So this is how adversarial images uh, exist. If we do the same procedure I said, where we backpropagate the wrong things uh, and take the outputs and take the L2 norm, we get a good result there as well. We are able to classify and say that these methods uh, are, are uh, these images are uh, adversarial rather than uh, normal images. Same thing exists for more corrupted input detection as well, uh, where we can say that, okay, this image, this is more from a AV setting where, okay, this image has some rain affecting it. This image has some snow affecting it. We can make uh, assertions about, okay, what the corruption is uh, in the environment or in the data acquisition process based on how these prompts and based on how these gradient features are, uh, are looking like. And one more thing I want to say, the last Last one is that these two applications that I showed, where uh, the first one was recognition, where it's like based on noisy images, we are able to recognize it. And the next one was detection. So in the first case, um, these gradient features were able to uh, kind of remove the noise factors out of it and get results which are, um, are robust, where it did not consider the noise in order to say that the network is robust. In the second application, it removed the, uh, the underlying features and looked at only the noise in order to say that it's corruption, right? In this kind of detection, it, it's able to say it's adversarial images. It's able to say it's corrupted. It's able to say it's out of distribution. So the same features that are used for making a decision about the features uh, are also used for looking at the uh, the, the corruptions that were uh, there before. And I think that is very important because if you look at it from a theoretical setting, what gradients are doing is essentially giving you a null space analysis of what was there in these network um, uh, parameters. So having access to activations and gradients gives us uh, this kind of uh, uh, recognition versus detection phenomena in this particular, um, uh, in this particular case. Uh, but I think that is the end of my talk. I think I'm uh, about five, seven minutes above uh, what I should have. Uh, if you need more uh, info, we do quite a lot of things. Uh, our, our main thing in the Olives lab is essentially going through and trying to uh, make more trustworthy AI, especially in more, everything I showed, of course, today was more from natural images, but we have work that spans biomedical images, seismic images, uh, and, and we essentially work on uh, those images. And also we want to have these kind of experts in the loop because in biomedical images, we want to have doctors in the process. We want to have them intervening within the process and saying, okay, uh, asking these kind of different questions and of, okay, why, is there a, uh, I don't know, a nodule in this image? Why is there fluid in your eyes instead of something else? And they should be able to um, uh, guide a network in their process in order to come to a certain conclusion. So a lot of what we do uh, goes towards this side of uh, the thing as well. If anybody has um, uh, wants to talk after this, you can go through uh, this website, uh, gasanalogy.ec.gartec.edu. Uh, you'll find me there. You'll find Professor Gasan over there as well. Uh, but yes, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? And if you are watching online, you can do questions in the chat and I'll go to Kami and ask for them. Any questions in the room? Okay, then I'll go first. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the computational aspects? Are these robust neural networks more difficult to train or is it like a similar order of magnitude? I did not talk about how um, this slide here actually gives us a way in order to reduce the computational aspect of it. The fact that the final fully connected layer is very sparse uh, here, actually, instead of backpropagating, let's say, uh, 
cat versus a, or in this case, zero, one, two, three, like 10 different times, I can actually back propagate a single vector of all ones. And there is a, an approximation to this in the paper that we go through quite a bit. Uh, I did not talk about the actual theoretical aspects of it, but instead of having order of n uh, computation speed, we can actually do it in order of one, essentially, where it's just we are back propagating a single uh, vector and we are taking the uh, the uh, output of your gradients and using that as the uh, image. So there is a an additional uh, uh, layer on top of it, uh, which is getting these features. But uh, there is a way in order to uh, reduce it as much as possible. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll bring you a mic. With the, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, nice. I can hear you. With neural networks, the the output, the softmax output, can be considered a proxy for confidence in the prediction. Yeah. Did you consider the uncertainty of the model as the difference between the confidence versus the actual likelihood of having a correct response? For example, if it's 99% confident in a cat, then it should be accurate 99% of the time if it's calibrated. Yeah, exactly. So that the, the word for what you just mentioned is calibration. So uh, the idea of uncertainty is a little bit different than calibration. Calibration goes into it. Calibration is a part of uncertainty, but um, I, I can describe uncertainty is when a network knows that it doesn't know. Like in an adversarial setting, for instance, even with the wrong output, it can um, give out a confidence of 99%. And this is one of the reasons that softmax outputs are not taken as proxy for uh, uncertainty. And that's why uh, in the beginning, during the explanation stage, I talked about this, um, uh, this blue curve here, which is log likelihood. The, there are two measures that we use for uncertainty. Log likelihood is one, Briar score is the other one. Uh, so these two are a better way of quantifying uncertainty than softmax output uh, by itself because of what you just said. There is a, uh, as your network has gotten larger, uh, I think there was this 2017 paper by Go where it was on the calibration of uh, uh, neural networks, where as your network has gotten larger, this difference between your uh, softmax output and your prediction accuracy has gotten larger as well. Like even cats, which are 99% confidence, are usually uh, accurate by 80%. So we take this kind of um, uh, bin and see that there is a difference between prediction accuracy and this one. So um, regarding the uncertainty aspect uh, by itself, in this particular paper, we have taken robustness to mean generalizable and calibrated like this. Uh, and calibration is exactly what you mentioned. It's the difference between prediction accuracy and uh, this one. But in the next paper, uh, this is basically all about uncertainty, where uh, the uncertainty is nothing more than a combination of these gradients and we evaluate it against log likelihood and prior score, which is uh, a true proxy, I would say, for uncertainty compared to like uh, calibration. Thank you. Okay, great. Then I propose we leave it there for today. Let's thank the speaker one more time. And we hope to see you all back next week on the other end of campus, so near Eyesway. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>